Jose Franco from Loughborough, uh, Phil Jones from DSDL, Konstantinos Katsikopoulos, who's currently at the Max Planck Institute Berlin, um, but imminently about to join us in Southampton. Uh, then John Malpas, Malpas from BT Research and Innovation, and Jeff Royston, who is former president of the OR Society, uh, and also formerly of Gores. And really, Jeff is to blame for uh, this session, I would say. So, um, if you were at OR55 in Exeter in uh, 2013, um, you will recall Jeff's presidential address on behavioural OR. So, well, it wasn't just on behavioural OR, but out of that arose this um, the whole behavioural OR initiative in the, um, in the society. So, I've, I've asked Jeff to talk about um, how he sees the progress since then. Phil is going to talk about, from a practitioner benefit, uh, what real life benefit has he seen from BOR. Alberto is going to talk about teaching it to students. Uh, John is going to talk about actually persuading practitioners to use BOR. And then Konstantinos is going to um, take a forward look and look at what next. Then we'll open the discussion up to you. And finally, we'll have, uh, have the prize draw for the book. So I just wanted to start off with, we were discussing, or Ruth was in her uh, plenary this morning, was talking about what is OR. Well, if you start talking about what is behavioural OR, you get as many different um, opinions as you do of what is OR itself. So are we talking about the way that models behave, or the way that the people who build the models or use them behave? Um, is it about how a model can change behaviour? Or is it about actually modelling behaviour itself, including uh, behaviour in models? Um, or is it about the need for having models which take account of human behaviour, which don't assume that people are rational and um, logical um, optimizers, but actually are living in the real world of messy problems? So I'm going to leave you with that because I think I'm sure we've got as many different opinions as to what behavioural OR is as what OR is. And I'm going to hand over to the first speaker, Jeff. Well, good afternoon. Um, I've got um, to talk to that uh, issue. Uh, it's interesting, uh, sort of the point that uh, Sally made about me sort of being responsible for this. Uh, actually, it goes back to at least 1964, a fact of which I was reminded at a talk I've just come from by Mitchell, who dug out BBC tapes um, from that have been made about OR with Pat Rivette and so on in it, and a third of those tapes actually was about human behaviour. And also in 1964, there was a conference on OR and social science, and a lot of that was about behaviour. Um, so people were thinking about it then, uh, but maybe not that much happened uh, in many years since 1964 on that topic. So perhaps it was something that did a bit more of a push after all those years. Um, the talk I gave at OR55, uh, that was the first slide, that was what it was uh, about, which wasn't actually about behavioural OR itself, although I very quickly got onto that uh, topic, and the reason I got onto that topic was because of this. Um, some of you will have seen this before, uh, those that haven't, perhaps I should just very quickly explain. This is the Johari window. Uh, the Johari window is actually a psychological tool invented by two psychologists um, who, uh, had, whose name is put together, make Joe Hari up, that's how I put his name. Um, and I sort of transferred that to the world of OR, thinking if we actually looked at what we see uh, in the world uh, professionally, what our clients see, then you can divide it into four quadrants. There's a bit that we recognise and our clients recognise, um, logistics, scheduling, all those classical useful tools, which I roughly described as decision physics. Um, there's the bit that we recognise that maybe not all our clients do, the problem structuring uh, work. Um, there's a bit that I suspect, and I'm talking about this on Thursday, um, which I think we both under-recognise, um, we and our clients, the system design stuff. But then there's a bit that our clients will think is pretty important, that, that anybody looking at problems should cover, and maybe they assume we do, but actually we don't recognise that very much, or we haven't until recently, that's the human behaviour bit. So that was my sort of starting point for thinking we really must uh, look quite hard at human behaviour, maybe the first port of call of improving our take on this, on this window. So one thing that we need to do in looking at one of the points in, uh, in, in Sally's list, um, 
all of which I'm sure would be relevant in different circumstances, but the one I particularly wanted to emphasize then was actually how to integrate the psychology with the physics when we model human activity systems. And this rather fuzzy diagram was meant to be a sort of logistics uh, model in which you have to think about what the drivers are thinking about all of this, and they actually want to visit to go and visit their sister or something every Wednesday, and maybe you haven't got that in your, in your model and you should talk to them about it, that sort of thing. Um, and if we're going to do that, it certainly involves some reframing of education and training uh, in our... Uh, the last slide in my talk was this. It said, coming soon, there are science initiative in fostering behavior operational research. So the sort of, that is a sort of starting point, and I guess now I have to say what has happened since. Well, I couldn't fit it all on one slide, but that's some of the things that have happened since. The Society held two workshops in the end of 2013 and the beginning of March 2014, so uh, we, we delivered not one but two workshops, as promised in the, uh, in the uh, talk in the summer. Um, the special interest group, with Sally uh, being very prominent in pushing with, with that, um, was set up in December 2014. Um, then there was a stream in I4s, we won in 2014, but also one in the Euro uh, last year. Uh, a special issue of eDraw published, um, nothing to do with, with, with me, but uh, there were 20 uh, papers uh, published in that, and I think 80 papers on behavioural have been submitted to it. Um, this year has been a summer school in Helsinki, uh, another stream at Euro. Uh, the book has come out uh, in July, um, and I gather there's a proposal now to establish a Euro working group on behavioural operational research. Um, early next year, and I'm sure I've missed quite a lot of things, but I ran out of space. So I think highly encouraging signs of progress is the sort of short summary of what I think has happened since. Um, but uh, never wanting to make people uh, too uh, contented and uh, at ease with what's going on, I think there's still some questions to ask. Um, things I would say we want to see. Uh, is education, training and practice in the OR community now routinely including behavioural OR? Um, I'd be pleased if somebody would say yes, but I think the answer is no. Um, are clients generally aware that we can and do incorporate behavioural aspects in our modelling, our dealing with it, and all those things maybe that uh, Sally put up? Um, comments on that, uh, thoughts on that. And are we showing program benefits in behavioural OR? So I'd want in another three years' time um, to be added to that list uh, some achievements in those, in those areas as well. Uh, and because if we can do that, last slide here, uh, we will actually get to the position which I was suggesting we should get to in that talk, uh, in our 55, where those things are currently in the sort of not so good quadrants uh, all move into the good quadrant, where we, we recognise and do it well, and our clients know we can do it well and, and, and like us for it. So that's my brief take on progress. It's interesting noting seeing the behavioural traits of the room, which is to stay close to the exit. So let's hope uh, that we don't uh, force you in that, even further in that general direction during our, uh, our, our talks, and particularly mine. Um, yeah, I was asked, what's the one benefit? And I found that quite a challenge. And uh, as we all seem to do, it involves us going into this sort of, okay, so what's our... What's the definition? So uh, I've come up with a personal definition and this is based on 15 years working in an interdisciplinary uh, group within DSTL. When I say interdisciplinary, uh, that includes historians, political scientists, anthropologists, psychologists of various types because they, they come in various different hues, um, as well as a few hard pressed quantitative types like, like myself. So here we go. Um, here's the sort of flavour, very simple framework for, for operational research. And uh, so starting with defining and analysing a problem, and then hopefully informing a decision, and something which in general I think we do too little of and that's monitoring whether there was actually any change, uh, whether or not we predicted what that change would be. And uh, if we just think about the stuff in yellow there, the problem, the decision, the change, um, 
anybody like to tell me what they all usually have in common? Any, any, those on the back row. <laughs> what do the problems, decisions, changes normally have in problem? What, what kind of entities are normally involved in those things in yellow? People. Thank you very much. Well done, Tony. I didn't prime him on his gun. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is my first example of how human scientists can help us. This uh, stick diagram produced by one of our more artistic anthropologists. Um, but I'm a great believer in plagiarism. So, um, okay. So if they involve people, let's first of all look at the stuff in white. Uh, sorry, the, the yellow there. Um, sorry, there's the cube. Um, the problem. It's not always the case. I went to a very interesting talk on defence, sorry, uh, data development analysis by accident this afternoon. So some, some, some problems that we deal with don't appear to be people focused. But a lot certainly in defence are, and uh, increasingly so, I would say. And usually there's some desired human change at an organisational level, uh, social level, maybe even just an individual level that we're, we're, we're trying to induce. Um, and if we think, taking, uh, looking at ourselves now, we also have traits and preferences. We have methods and models that uh, we use. The question is, do they do they fit the problem, or are we, in classical way, fitting the problem around with tools that we know we can use? If we look at the decision makers, they themselves have styles and traits. One style and trait I see amongst this community is a belief that a decision is a, a discrete moment in time, a, a sort of somebody signing some treaty or whatever, uh, and it's done by an individual. And of course, the reality in most organisations, even the most hierarchical military ones, is that it's a social process and that that decision evolves and changes over time. This then leads to questions about how do we interact and communicate with uh, that decision making process in an effective way. Then finally looking at monitoring change are things going to plan? I often think that OR is what I term a pre-decision science, i.e. once the decision is made, we all go away and we just trust that our decision, our, sorry, our, our uh, suggestions are going to be taken up and that they're going to actually result in something better. Not just a better decision, we have the science of better, not the science of better decisions. And that involves uh, in most large-scale change processes, doing that sort of mid-course correction process. So what can we provide? Obviously things like change assessment, and we also have to challenge ourselves occasionally. How good was the advice we actually provided? Did that actually result in the changes we, we thought it might? And when we look at all of those things on the right there, there's a consistent theme, I believe. And that's that they all involve, certainly when we've got people-focused problems, we can, they can all benefit from drawing on human science. And if, when I sort of reflect on what the, the sort of behavioural OR theme, I think we're very good at looking at certain segments of that. But I come from it with a broader uh, vision that actually we can, uh, where we need to, and it's not quite a question of universally doing this, but actually, when appropriate, drawing on this expertise. Um, and uh, so, having laid that out, let's just look at some of the changes that have happened. Um, I, I've had quite a lot of experience working in DSTL. I certainly remember the days when, when qualitative tech, we had our psychologists sitting in the corner doing human factors and personnel performance studies, and we
we never really talked to them. Um, so one of the significant changes, and we see that a lot today in today's conference, that actually many of the, the talks I've been to today, there's active consideration of many of the things that you see up there. Um, so some specific examples around uh, uh, modelling and things like uh, we, the peace support operations model. I'd say probably the biggest impact we've had in terms of behavioural OR is actually we deploy psychologists and anthropologists as part of our analysis teams these days. Uh, because particularly when we were going to places like Afghanistan, where the human component is as important as the te technological one. Uh, fitting methods and tools. Um, Rob up there will be very used to the fact that we have a psychologist who whenever he says, but this, we, this will help inform decision making. Uh, this individual, uh, which we know as Gareth, um, will come back and say, Hang on, have you got any evidence to suggest that your, this method, model, approach is actually helping? Is it actually improving the decision? Is it? And uh, also we have a tendency to use what we're comfortable with and actually that community provide an excellent challenge function. Going down, I think probably the big thing that we've seen over the last, as, as, as Jeff said, quite a long time now, is that we've recognised this social process around decision making, hence the amount of effort involved in sort of development of social soft OR techniques. Probably one that has made a lot of progress within DSDL is actually the need to interact and communicate. Sorry. There was a time when we'd get given a question, we'd go away for six months in a huddle and then we'd come back with an answer and find out that things have moved on. <laughs> or whatever. Doesn't happen these days. Also, we're much smarter in the products we produce for, for people. Still some challenges. You'll see some reading tests out in the poster area. Um, but overall, we can use things like information science, information design, to help improve how we communicate and not just through things like soft OR and, and better processes. Finally, the monitoring of change. Um, I've been involved in, in developing an assessment methodology for some organisational change in DSTL. Quite a lot of desire just to keep it to measuring financial performance. But actually, the real heart of it is, is has something changed terms of organisational culture. And again, we can use human science to help support and develop best practice for that kind of activity. So, I hope I've given you some examples. Okay, I've given you some DSL ones. But actually, we see across the board in most of those areas that behavioural OR, uh, what's termed behavioural OR, is, is having an impact in the way we, we uh, run our discipline. And so back to the exam question, which is uh, one impact of BOR. And we get the apologies to Gareth, who should be here to say, what evidence have you got? I'll, I'll say, actually better decisions than better analysts. Sorry, that's two, but there we go. Um, I, I honestly believe that that's actually, uh, <coughs> we live in a world where there is a, of humans, of social systems, and actually drawing on that knowledge in a, in a knowledgeable way uh, is, is, uh, is really what I think is the heart of what's making us relevant to the current day. So that's my one impact and I'll hand over to my next speaker. Thank you very much. of time and that this is a pilot so we already eaten half an hour of your time on this so I'm gonna be very quick. Uh, uh, Sally asked me to, to talk about um, how do we teach behavioral OR and, and the question is well what, what bits of behavioral OR we should teach or not so I'm gonna give you my, my own take on it. Uh, 
So um, just, I'm going to start from the point that uh, if, you, if, if we look at the literature, what has been published about behavioral OR, you see two streams of work. Uh, one stream of work is about um, including behavioral factors in models, modeling behavior. So all this system dynamics, agent based simulation, and so on. Uh, but also mathematical models that include theories of behavior in those. That's, that's fine. Um, and then you have what I call the evaluation stream, which is concerned very much about what Phil was saying, which is how or an OR supported process or an OR project uh, changes behavior or is affected by behavior as well. So, so the, the, those two things, they have different requirements. And um, if I'm looking at the sort of a, the modeling uh, uh, behavior bit, and if I have to teach that, I think what I need to uh, I will have to get my students or our students um, to, to be mu very much aware of uh, what theories of behavior you're using to work in your models. And they have to be explicit about those. And they are, uh, uh, Sally has done some work, for example, using that little model of behavior about uh, uh, intention and, and, and behavior uh, in her models. And so uh, we will have to get our students to be familiar with at least a range of uh, theories of behavior that you can be uh, uh, use, using to, to code your models. Um, and, I, and, I, and I split two, two types of theories. Uh, you know, if you're doing uh, system dynamics, for example, you, know, you, you talk about local theories because you ask people what the system is doing right now. And they tell you a story and then you build a hypothesis of how the system operates. But if you are doing what studies, you know, work is done, is she looks for a particular theory of behavior that has been tested from psychology, and then you apply that in the model. So that's that. Um, if you are on the evaluation uh, stream of work, you know, trying to understand how behavior affects or is affected by an OR supported process, then what we need is the students to, 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 to get uh, acquainted with how do you evaluate the impact. And if you look at the literature, there are two ways of evaluating impact. Many people use a variance approach, which is experimental, basically. So I'm going to use some methodology. Um, before and after, I'm going to make, measure a change. You know, um, whether it is one change, is, 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 you know, it can be defined. It can be mental model change, learning. It can be consensus. It can be many things. But uh, the other approach to understand behavioral issues uh, is the process approach in which you follow an OR supported process as it goes. And then what you are trying to understand is how, from the beginning you know, the, the, of the project, how you, you, you reach the outcome. And then you have to collect data in that, in that, in that sort of way. So in that longitudinal approach requires a process theory, uh, and the variance approach requires a variance very theory. So if that is the case, how do, how do I implement in a, in, a, in a master's course, for example? Well, if we are serious about developing modeling approaches that include behavior, then the best way to put them is, is to, uh, many master's courses in OR, they cover what they call it the broad consulting OR skills kind of course. In some cases, it's just a semester, some cases throughout the whole year. And in, in most of those modules, and I've been in many institutions in the 20 years I've been in this country, so. Uh, I'm aware that in many, in many of these masters, um, we cover, this, uh, uh, at some point, the standard theories of rationality, for example. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the part when I would actually go beyond that and say, well, there are other theories of behavior that might have implications for us or, or might be useful for our model. So I'll, I'll do that. And then for the evaluation type of behavioral or studies, uh, uh, the best way is to is to link it to the summer project. Yeah, and most of uh, masters in OR uh, have to do a consulting project at the end, uh, where uh, you ask students to produce a model, a model, report for a client, and so on. But you also ask them, uh, usually, uh, for a reflective piece. It's, it's, can you reflect about your project? Well, that's when they can actually think about behavioral aspects. And if, if there is a means by which uh, we can uh, train our students in these evaluation approaches, variance or process approach, they can actually use that as part of a, the modeling uh, project. So they do the project, but at the same time, they are collecting data to evaluate the project that will help them to reflect at the end. So that's the way I would go about uh, um, increasing awareness and perhaps training students in that. And of course, 
apart from MSCs, um, and I, I was the one who submitted the proposal for the uh, working group uh, and, and the hero law. So one of the, the, the things that we suggested is that we have workshops for, for, for students in which we're going to be training them on these things. So that's, that's one of the things that we will be doing if we get the, the, the group approved. Um, so what are the key challenges then for educators? Well, the challenges are, are significant because if you want to get your students to get familiar with theories of behavior, uh, then you have to be a bit acquainted with those theories in the first place. And, uh, uh, and that, that's a challenge. And there are certain communities that are quite familiar with behavioral economics theories, for example. Decision analysis community is typical. They, they know a lot about that, but um, not with others. Yeah. So, but, so what you're doing, the theory of planned behavior is no everybody knows it. So maybe, maybe there's something, a challenge for, for educators. And the other bit is um, uh, in terms of evaluation, uh, educators have to be very clear with the students at least I am clear with my students that textbook OR is nothing, nothing as, uh, it's not the same as, as, as real OR. In fact, textbook OR is just an idea. In practice, it, it's different. And therefore, uh, what we need to develop is materials that are based on real projects in which uh, uh, um, we train students about what actually works or not. Um, and, and I'm talking not only about the, the technical element, which is the modeling, but also about interacting with clients, presenting results, you know, uh, eliciting you know, data, all sorts of things that we, we read about it, but we don't really learn until we do it. But if we have some materials that are based on real data, not in hypothetical scenarios, but real projects, then perhaps we'll have an opportunity to, to get the uh, students to, to do role plays with real data. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things that we're doing a lot for anyway, but uh, maybe uh, something that you can think and comment here later on. And that's all I have to say. So there you go. John. I can't decide whether to leave this glasses on, glasses off. <coughs> um, afternoon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, this was the question Sally posed for me, and I thought long and hard about it. And I've come to the conclusion, it's not easy. Um, <clears throat> so rather than try and answer and give you specific answers, I'll start by telling you a little bit of a personal story. Um, about 29 years ago, I stepped through the hallowed portals of the then Portsmouth Polytechnic to study maths. <clears throat> if you can't see me, there I am. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently I haven't changed, I <laughs> But um, in that course, I studied weird and wonderful things, including graph theory. I learned how to program in Pascal, but also in all things. I used Minitab on BBC Micro to, um, to do stats. And I was also taught a course on OR. I still have a textbook. This is it. it. Sits on my desk. I occasionally refer to it, not very often, because. Oh, there isn't a mention of behaviour in it. <clears throat> and interestingly, there's a copy of a, an operational re operations research book on the bookstall in, on the ground floor across the way. That doesn't have a mention of behaviour in it either. So there we were, learning about queuing theory and linear programming in Ruth, simplex. Um, <clears throat> and all of these assumptions that were published in 2003 rang true, or ring true, from what I was taught. That people are deterministic, everything is constant, we don't really change very much, workers are stationary, they change over time. And when I left B um, Portsmouth to take up a, ro a role in BT's research group, which was full of process engineers and OR people, they rang true as well. And I kind of began to think, where do, we, where do we go with this? And eventually what happened was I got involved in a project, more of a production management project than an OR one, where we were asked to challenge the then basic tenant or fundamental tenet of um, BT's resourcing, pro um, resourcing program, which was 
engineers do three jobs a day. Why? Well, <coughs> after being accused of sitting in our ivory towers developing models that were useless in the real world, we thought we'll go and see the real world. And it looked a bit like this. It's messy, it's snowy, it's cold. There are things that scare you. Um, I can't lose the point on it. But it, it doesn't behave as we would hope it to behave. And when engineers tell you that the reason why they do three jobs a day is because that's what management expect, <laughs> that's what they conform to. Um, and there, there, are some, there are all sorts of things. And over the course of um, what's now nearly 20 years of BT, I've done a number of projects in OR, business transformation, <coughs> management science, where I've always tried to come from the, the background of what do, how will people behave or what do they behave. So when we look at why don't people use a system correctly, <coughs> well, we go out and try and find out why uh, or what their job entails that means that they don't do and they don't follow the process. If you want to change a process, how are you going to engage people in that process you know, <coughs> to adopt a different way of practice? Um, <coughs> these are some of the techniques we use to actually study behaviour, and we, I've learned this from um, engaging with ethnographers, anthropologists, psychologists. Um, I work very closely with someone who purports to be a psychologist, although she has a geochemistry degree. Um, <coughs> but you know, the only way of really finding out how people work is to actually go and, and get out there. <coughs> so, <coughs> to answer your question, Sally, how do we get more practitioners to use um, VOR? Education. And I would go right back to undergrad, not necessarily teaching behaviour as a, as a subject, but try and debunking some of those assumptions that we, um, we hold so dear. Experience. There is no <coughs> substitute for getting out there and talking to people, be it not field engineers necessarily, but people in offices, finding out how they run processes or use a system. Um, one, of the, so one of the things I did was to question, or try and answer a question, why do <coughs> people take so long to boot up their machines in the morning? Do we need to replace their, their machines? Well, <coughs> we could, but people have already <coughs> overcome that by turning the machine on, having their breakfast, going back and looking at the machine when, it, when it's booted up. <laughs> so unless you actually get out there, you can't find it. Engagement. Um, Behaviour is a dirty word sometimes um, in commercial organisations, but if you can engage a senior member of um, the organisation, it helps greatly. But also engaging, with, as Phil said, with psychologists, ethnographers, anyone else that can give you a different view on things, get with them. And then the final one, explain the benefits, and this is not, this is the hard bit, is to actually capture the benefits of behaviour <coughs> and improving your your um, your operational research project with, by including behaviour. Trying to isolate that benefit is is difficult, but it's possible and it's worth doing. And failing that, read the book. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I interpret my question as uh, referring to where next for research, and I think mostly academic research, and even more specifically, interdisciplinary research in those behavioral social sciences such as economics and psychology. So I'm going to tell you I picked up two things that I think are important methodologically for uh, behavioral operational research to learn. Uh, from economics and psychology, and sometimes also to avoid learning from economics and psychology. And, and you will see, uh, very likely, I was happy to see, I think there, there's a, a very nice overlap with, uh, with education, so with, uh, with Alberto's talk. Um, so, I guess I'm doing a little bit provocative, and I would say, in a way, it's not so easy to learn from, from the behavioral sciences, because if you just try to read the headlines of these sciences, it could be that you pick up things that are not that useful. In fact, 
they may hurt. And there's a very simple reason that human behavior is very sensitive to context and to incentives, to other things too, but these two are enough to actually create many problems when you run experiments with people. Of course, you have to have a very good design, you have to do the statistics well, and so on and so forth, but that's still not enough. <coughs> Just because human behavior is so sensitive, the data is full of noise, and the result in the end almost is, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but just to make the point, the result almost is that you cannot trust the results of any single study in the end that's published in Psychology and Economics. Rather, you should look at the new tools that have been developing very rapidly lately. So uh, replication, meta-analysis, uh, screening studies for uh, selective uh, reporting, for hypothesis phishing, which is lately uh, packages as hypo hypothesis testing, well, it was not, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you just go to standard behavioral, uh, let's say, let's speak about decision analysis, which is mostly the, the, the area I engage with. So if you, if you look at the standard behavioral decision research textbook, you will see that people uh, exhibit framing effects, uh, too much choice effect, intransitivity, and so on and so forth. But I can tell you, if you go a, a deep, uh, a layer deeper, you will see that when meta-analysis or controlled uh, replication studies have been done on these things, none of these things that I just mentioned have actually stand to scrutiny. So I think a bad thing for a behavioral or person when they act as a consumer of uh, standard behavioral research or when they try to get inspiration from behavioral research is to simply read the textbook and assume that the, the people that we study, the people that we study, that make decisions outside the lab, uh, under high stakes, under time pressure, that they exhibit the same, uh, the same findings that are purported to, to occur in, uh, in, the, in behavioral science textbooks. Uh, rather, I think that it's a little bit sad, but it's also a very nice opportunity. It just means that there's a role uh, for anybody who just wants to run nice studies in organizations uh, on how people uh, make relevant decisions. And this is, in a way, this is simply a, a tremendous advantage for operations research people because they have access to these people. They can get the data, while usually cognitive psychologists can't. They, it's not true that everybody studies undergraduates in their lab. But still, it's much, much harder for, for cognitive psychologists to get access to the kind of data that we can have access relatively easily through master's projects and engagement with companies and so on and so forth. So that was my first point uh, about gathering the evidence. Uh, and the second point would be how to integrate. So here I'll try to be a little bit provocative since all on the last speaker and then we're, we're feeling in the, into the Q&A. Uh, even though we, we, we talk about integrating behavior in in our models. I don't think we exactly have a systematic way of doing it. We're still at the stage of saying we should do it. Everybody accepts that. Everybody realizes it could, it could provide gains. But we don't exactly have a method. Now, you may say maybe it's not possible to have a method. But that, that's a valid concern. But nevertheless, again, I think we should think about how the method should look like. And I think the method should, should go much beyond uh, Current practice, and again, I'll, I'll pick, I'll pick on a little bit uh, on decision analysis, where the, the the point usually is to to change behavior by eliminating or modifying or modifying some biases. There's of course nothing wrong if you have established, for example, that a person uh, exhibits framing effects. For example, you may know the studies with uh, doctors and the surgery they can manipulate patients by framing the probability of success of a surgery in terms of uh, dying or staying alive and so on. Of course, there's nothing wrong into eliminating such things, but only when it's clear that these behaviors are ineffective. So especially for the framing effect, I think and this, this, would be, this would relate to what Phil was saying. In managerial context, framing is not stupid. It's actually a very intelligent human way to communicate meaning by using the flexibility of natural language, the fact that we're not logicians, 
when we communicate each other in a, in a managerial context is because exactly we're able to imply without saying, and this is much more powerful in getting somebody to do something if you, if you tell them without telling them. So before we, we start complaining that people exhibit framing effects, we have to evaluate on the job whether the framing effect creates a, a, a decreases performance <coughs> or is it just merely something that's, I would even say, slightly illogical, but it doesn't matter in fact to bring a lot of games. So we cannot just complain and start eliminating behaviors, but rather we need, I think, we, we need to understand. Uh, there was also a talk today at the behavioral OR, uh, OR stream about uh, soft action research where the goal was not necessarily to, uh, to improve, but was to understand. And I think many times, not always, but many times, especially as a scientist, it's, it's good to first understand before you try to improve. So just trying to eliminate behaviors or changing them based on, uh, on, on, on other, other researchers' arguments where, where it's simply found that undergrads do mistakes in the lab and it's not clear that this is a mistake for an experienced person on the job. I think that doesn't work. So we should, we should launch some kind of uh, program that tries exactly to understand why these behaviors are there, what are the functions that try to accomplish, and then evaluate uh, under what conditions these functions are accomplished and under which are not. And as far as I have seen, this I'm sure you can find many nice, excellent studies where uh, fragments of that have been done, but I've never seen it programmatically stated and pursued. And then when you educate master students or doctoral students or postdoctoral fellows, where we try to do something like that. So these are my two ideas for where next in BOR research. Okay, <laughs> okay, um, very interesting vignettes, thank you. Um, but the question for me, whether OR practitioners use behavioural OR is surely a behavioural trait. So have we applied behavioural OR techniques to OR practitioners to understand their behaviour to not practice more behavioural OR? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. It's, I, I have a, a colleague who sits literally across the, the, the aisle from me, and I was talking to him the other day, and he said, yeah, we're trying to predict engineer behaviour. And I said, have you been out with them yet? No. Do you think you should? Probably. And he's an experienced analyst. Um, he's been working for VT longer than I have, and he still doesn't get the idea of behavioural operational research. Uh, get behavioural operational research. But when I was talking to him about it, he, get, he suddenly bought into the idea. So, can we, can we apply techniques? I don't know, but we certainly can keep talking to people and explaining the benefits of behaviour and understanding behaviour. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, my serious point is, there's clearly a value in this, but why aren't more people in this room and other areas doing it? What's stopping us? I don't know if people aren't doing it, that's the problem. I, I, I've been doing it for 20 years. I didn't know I was doing it for 17 of those years, until Jeff told me I was doing it. <laughs> so, I think it's explaining that we need to have a lot more clarity and understanding and it comes back down to the question Ruth was posing earlier on what is OR and Sammy was saying what's behavioural operation research. I don't think it's very clear what, what actually it is. So, hopefully by creating some clarity around the subject it might become more apparent. I have a completely unevidence-based theory about this, so uh, you feel completely free to ignore everything I say. Um, when I was looking at the material back in those conferences in 64 and 89, which were big OR and social science conferences, particularly the first one, 
there's this great feeling that, oh, after its great wartime success and its quite considerable success in, in industry, it can now move on to sort of conquer the world of uh, uh, politics and government and uh, everything else, um, moving into the social sphere. Uh, and that clearly was not the case in the sense, at least, that the uh, people pursuing that thought intended. Now, it's not at all the same thing as saying that oh, it has been successful in government work, of course, but in terms of uh, the, the big influences they were talking about and the very radical influences they were talking about, it was clearly a bridge too far. And I think it was a bridge too far, partly because it was just ridiculously really, really ambitious, but also partly for the reason you say that the sort of mindset of people that go into our uh, is rather different from the mindset of people that go into politics, for example. Um, and one of the uh, attractions of behavioural art was that maybe that sits somewhere in between, that it's a little bit less far moving from, from R into, well, some parts of the economics and psychology than in moving into you know, politics and ethnography and, and, and the rest of it. Um, never, and the evidence for that, there's been a little bit of evidence, is, as Jonathan said, to the extent to which our people are generally involved in science and sort of practical work, and that includes a lot of people, of course, in academia uh, through consultancy work. Um, you can't escape doing behavioural work, at least of the sort that's uh, you have to get on with people and understand what people want, etc. Uh, the suggestion would be that maybe it's not as sort of conscious or maybe not as informed by some um, psychology theory, say, as it, as it might be. When it comes to modelling, uh, which is my particular sort of lacunae observation, um, you can ignore it completely if you want to, because you can do models that are entirely you know, deterministic or uh, behaviour free. Um, but that looked to be really rather a serious e error. Um, but some people, again, may uh, prefer the models that you can do as nice textbook, unreal world examples, because it's neat and tidy, and maybe you know, some people like being neat and tidy, right? nothing wrong with that. But maybe they are the people that should be trying to do behaviour modelling. However, my view was that things have shifted a bit, particularly in both of those fronts. There's more information now, thanks to people like Kahneman and so on, and some of the economists, other economists working in this area, to actually inform how we get on with people and deal with people and how people make decisions and how people react to models and so on. And there's more information, more on the modeling front, like agent-based modeling, uh, no, it's not the suit of everything, but as an example of how models automatically almost include behavior for agent-based models. Um, so my thought was that that bridge has moved a little nearer and therefore it's not such a big, a, a big jump to, 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 to make and that's sort of hope about how it might actually uh, catch on a bit more. But it's, this is, I have very little evidence for that. <laughs> Just quickly, I, I, one of the observations I've seen from working in groups that range from very hard scientists, sort of mathematically orientated, right through to people who believe that, that, that critical discourse analysis is, is the way forward, which is quite an esoteric uh, um, <coughs> social science area, um, is that actually most, if you put them together, most do move together. You might be at really polarised extremes to start off with, but actually over time you see people understanding others' perspectives in terms of the science. And uh, the, the hard analysts understand that the, the psychologist can say it depends, it depends on the context. It's usually the stock answer you'll get from uh, social scientists if you don't explain the context. Uh, and equally, the social science will start to realise, yes, there's more to it than just explaining the real world. There's something that we want to do to intervene to improve it. So, Yes, there is everybody in those, everywhere on those extremes, but actually by working together, you do reduce the gap.
your reading. Yes, and the author of Gene Woolley at one of our conferences um, talked about the reason why you should go and look at the job. And he quote, I think Beck's Brewery in the States. And why, why weren't they using one of their hoists to ship beer around? And modeling the thing wasn't the point. You had to go and realize when you looked at it, you couldn't get a forklift truck into the third hoist. You couldn't use it anyway. <laughs> um, teaching students, create a situation where you make a decision using the optimization method, say, which comes out of the decision, locate the facility. So the example of my mind, locate the facility at location A. If you put it at B, it will actually cost you a bit more. But the employment situation at B will be far better than the impact, the adverse impact on location A. So you then bring some politics into the situation. And that will get people thinking. If you put it in the context of a nationalised industry, which this problem was set, obviously politics comes in. If you're looking at a you know, private industry, you've got the situation, will the people that own that business think about the impact on their business of making a decision which is purely optimally economical? And that is your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, those, those type of uh, scenarios that are relevant, we, we, we currently use are, are obviously very, very useful in, in a sense. But um, and this reminds me of um, a colleague of mine, Alofro. She's done a lot of work with the police, and, um, and they were trying to train, uh, they were, they were training uh, police interviews. You know, how do you conduct a police And they have a role play for that. Um, and, and if you if you observe the, in the role play, everybody you know sort of acts according to the script and it works and you learn. But when you actually see the, the real interviews, they're nothing to do nothing to do with the role play at all. And so what they decided is to say, well, can we um, identify and collect data from real interviews and identify multiple instances in which the, in which the interviews go well and in, the, in which the interviews go, go badly. And so they have these trajectories identified. And they create role plays with that data. And then they train policemen uh, without telling them what the trajectory is uh, so that they can actually start to engage in the, in the role play. And they make decisions about the interview. And then only after that, after they've done something, they reveal what the trajectory of the interview would have been based on data. So I'm thinking that sort of data that we should be developing for or our analysts for our future trainees. You know, how does an interview with a client is conducted? Can we identify multiple instances of that? Or go well and go so well? Or when we present results, or when we run a workshop, or when we're meeting with our teams, you know, for, for model. And if we do that, then we are actually we can create materials that students can say, ah, okay, so that's 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 this is real data. This is this is the way it happens actually. Rather than only relying on sort of a complex, rich scenarios, but they still, they still idealize the pictures, not, not real data. That's, that's my take. 